All right, let's get started. We've already heard this morning uh, some insights on where we are in the economic cycle, and we're going to tackle this next, I think, from the distinct perspective of the private equity sponsor. I'm joined by a terrific panel of GPs this morning. Um, they are, to my left, Dan Lemoyne, uh, principal at Brook Private Equity Associates, Mark Gormley, partner, Lee Equity, and Chris Egan, managing director at Advent International. For more detailed information on the panelists, uh, please check out the Super Returns US East app or their website, uh, where you'll find lots more information about, uh, about them. So I want to briefly set the stage this morning by highlighting some of the broader market trends um, you know, that we're seeing. There, there are a lot of signals um, that we're you know, looking at top of the market conditions, both in the private equity industry but also more broadly, we've got record purchase price multiples, high leverage multiples, dramatic growth in credit availability, especially private credit, a huge run up in the public equities markets. We've got record low unemployment. We've got record fundraising, con you know, continued accumulation of huge amounts of dry powder uh, and more. Um, so we've got all that going on. At the same time, we've also got a number of what I would call sort of looming threats. We've got We've got global trade tensions, you know, as recently as last week. We've got dramatic weakness in the economies of certain of the emerging markets. We've got the risk of interest rate increases that everyone's focused on. We've got inflation at a six-year high, fluctuations in commodity prices. You've got fresh worries about the Eurozone. I mean, it was just a few weeks ago somebody was worried, you know, is Italy going to pull out of the Eurozone? It's, it's almost hard to believe. Uh, and, 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 and on and on. Um, it, when you take that all together, there seems to be this sort of collective sentiment that the next downturn is expected to occur um, sometime sooner rather than later, but people aren't sure exactly when. One of my neighbors uh, out in Connecticut who works on Wall Street, he says, he said, I've never seen so many fully invested bears. Um, and I think that kind of captures a lot of the sentiment in, in the market. So I, I want to be the first to say, you know, I, let's all hope that the current mood music keeps on playing. Um, but for purposes of this panel, I want to start the discussion by hearing from the group on how you and your firms have been thinking about and preparing for and guarding against uh, this potential downside risk. So, Mark, why don't we start with you, if that's okay. Let's talk about the investment process in private equity and portfolio management. It, it, you know, in this environment, as a private equity professional, when you're evaluating a new investment and you're, you're assuming kind of the typical four to seven year hold period, are you essentially assuming that a downturn's gonna occur during your fund's ownership of the asset? And if so, how does that impact your thinking um, and your process as an investor? So uh, thank you, Andrew, and thank you for uh, Super Return for uh, hosting this. Um, and good morning. I'm, I'm, I'm certainly not gonna start the morning saying that the, uh, uh, saying that the party's over. Um, but we're well aware that we're in the ninth year of an economic uh, recovery. We're in the second longest uh, economic recovery in the history of this country. So, you know, one has to be very cautious. And, and certainly we're being cautious as we think about investments um, uh, today and, 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 and how they might withstand a, a correction in the marketplace. Um, broadly, we're, you know, we're, we're focusing on, on, on businesses that are, uh, you know, sort of durable, consumer durables. Uh, who are res uh, somewhat um, re recession resistant, healthcare services, uh, consumer durables that are, that are, are likely to stay, uh, certain segments of, of uh, services in the financial services sector. So it's, you know, it starts with you know, focusing on the right segments um, and obviously with the right management teams. Um, in this environment, we're also trying to create uh, businesses at, at much lower multiples in an otherwise very competitive environment. Um, and so, as a result, we're, we're, we're buying businesses that are a little bit um, smaller than we typically would, and, and uh, that's affording us the opportunity to stay away from the auctions. And, and uh, so, we're, we're trying to uh, dampen any impact of, of, a, of a potential recession um, with, with a going in purchase multiples um, and making them a little bit, you know, s focusing on slightly smaller businesses uh, where we can where we can build up the space and create businesses that we would otherwise pay uh, a higher multiples for. So that's allowing us the opportunity to invest in businesses at two to four multiples below uh, the clearing prices in, in, the, in the market. And then lastly, we're using a lot, a lot less leverage. 
Um, uh, one, these businesses that we, that we have historically, one, these businesses are a little smaller, uh, so they're, they're mid-teens as opposed to, to, uh, uh, to mid-20s plus, um, and, and so they're, um, they can withstand less leverage. Um, and second is, you know, while we think that the economy seems stable to us for the next 12 to 18 months, um, you know, it's, we're aware of where we are, and so we're, we're putting on a lot less leverage on these businesses. And so our, our reaction to the current market environment is um, lower, you know, uh, defensive industries, lower purchase prices with less leverage. Great. Uh, Chris, Dan, you want to add anything to that? Or? Uh, sure. I, I mean, I think, um, you know, Mark, Mark said it well in terms of some of the ways that we're looking at things. I, you know, at Advent, um, we're very much a multi-sector fund and then also um, uh, diversified from a global perspective. Um, so we, I think, are cognizant of the macro environment that we're operating in, but, but always try to make, um, you know, decisions on an individual uh, micro basis. And I think some of the things that... You know, we're trying to do to, to buy down those purchase price multiples, uh, similar to what Mark was, was saying. Um, we're trying to um, develop some of these quick wins in our portfolio. Uh, so some operational improvements, um, things like pricing uh, and other initiatives that we've done successfully at, at uh, prior companies, trying to get those going almost immediately uh, after we sign the deal, uh, such that when we're closing, we're, we're already um, you know, implementing some of these operational improvements. Uh, I'd say the other thing we're, we're focused on is, um, you know, trying to bring um, a couple businesses together um, simultaneously. All right? So I think, um, you know, M&A continues to be a good uh, driver of opportunity in our portfolio. Uh, and again, we're trying to pull that forward and think about can we combine a couple businesses uh, right off the bat. Um, we did that earlier this year uh, in the payment space uh, deal that we closed in March. So, so those are some of the creative um, you know, approaches that we're trying to take uh, while being mindful that, um, you know, we probably will see uh, a downturn over this next four to seven year period when we're making these investments, uh, but trying to get out of the box really strongly so that the uh, company is well positioned uh, when we see that downturn. Terrific. Yeah, I'd agree with, you know, both things that have been said from, uh, from both Mark and Mark and Chris, and that, you know, the one thing I might add there is, you know, what we've done is we've tried to increase uh, sourcing efforts, and and just really gone, you know, and made a concerted effort to really step up our game to maybe 50 to 75 percent ahead of what we would have done in a normal environment to get to more opportunities in more areas of the market that normally we wouldn't have gone and wouldn't have seen from sources that are a little more unique and potentially more creative. Terrific. You know, when, when talking about this topic, you, you think back to the global financial crisis, it's hard to believe that was a, a decade ago. Um, you know, although when you look back and you think about it, it, it turns out actually that a number of the, you know, I think the private equity industry as a whole and, and a lot of the private equity investments that were done during that time actually weathered the period quite admirably. Um, you know, I don't think any of us was looking to relive those years, but, um, but it's sort of an interesting lesson, and, and it, it made, made me think, it, and, and I'm wondering, Chris, maybe we could stick with you. Are, are there lessons that you learned from, from that period and working through that that you would expect to draw on, or, uh, you know, if, if we were to go into another downturn, um, or do you think that the kind of the macro conditions and the challenges that we're facing now are somehow very different from, from what happened then? Yeah, so I mean, I would say that um, uh, we're, we're hoping we don't see something like, like we saw uh, back in the 08, 09 period. Um, I think that was, um, you know, extreme on a, on a lot of levels. But, um, you know, we do think we will see some form of downturn. So, so in terms of um, lessons learned, I think um, one of the things we take away from that period is to, um, uh, and, and we've con tried to continue to, uh, to play through, is uh, maintain our exit discipline. So, um, you know, when we hit our uh, expected returns uh, and we see an opportunity to, to exit, uh, we, we make sure we take it. Um, and I think that's even more true in this environment with the, with the exit market as frothy as it is. Uh, I think it's easy in our business to, you know, to fall in love with our companies and fall in love with our management teams, but the reality is things do change. 
so again, when we see an opportunity to exit, uh, we do it. And what I think that allows us to do is, is just to have more capacity uh, in the shop to um, you know, manage companies that might be going through some challenges, uh, particularly if we're seeing a downturn. And then importantly, I think it gives us more capacity to um, you know, put money to work. Uh, so we um, you know, raised a fund uh, uh, in April uh, of 09. So it was basically right um, you know, going into the teeth of the crisis. And uh, it, it turned out to be a great opportunity for us. So we were able to put uh, money to work uh, over that next two to three year period. And those are you know, probably some of the best deals we've ever done at Advent. Uh, be, because we had capital uh, in our pocket and we had capacity uh, to really look at new deals and, and had a portfolio that was, that was relatively small at the time. Um, and so we were able to do some creative things like a deal we did with Fifth Third Bank um, where we bought 51% of their payment processing asset um, you know, at a time when you know, people were concerned is Fifth Third going to go out of business. Um, and again, we were able to step up and do that transaction because we had a fresh fund and some some real ability to analyze that situation. So um, those are some examples of, of things that we've learned, but um, you know, we're always mindful that this one probably be, will be different and we'll be learning some things on the fly, um, uh, but I do think we can draw on some of, those, some of those prior lessons. So I would say that the, you know, we, we're all beneficiaries today of uh, the, the rising tide uh, lifts all boats. Um, but if you go back to 08 and 09, you, know, you, you saw what Buffett often referred to is when the tide goes out is you really see who, what, what, what everybody's bathing suit looks like. And, and from our perspective, um, the, 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 one of the big lessons learned was the strength of management. Um, and, and, and really a big focus on today is that, you know, if you're, you know, given where we are in the economic cycle, um, the focus on, on, on starting with the right management team Building that management and continue to build that management team and its capabilities is, is critical um, because to us it's not a matter of if we're going to have a, a correction, um, it's really when we're going to have a correction and, and you need to have that management team uh, that's fully capable of, of, um, of you know, working that company through the, you know, tough economic times. I, I'm, we're all hopeful and, and we don't believe that the correction when it comes will be of the similar uh, magnitude of the correction that we all experienced in, in, in 08 um, and 09, um, but, but there's certainly a lot of froth in the marketplace that, 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 that can come out of the market. And so our, our biggest um, focus today is, is partnering with the right management team. Um, and the, 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 the second thing is, is, is really what Chris talked about earlier is um, in addition to partnering with the right management team is, is, is really getting some, some early wins fast. Um, and getting a strong M and A pipeline to buy all that multiple, so that your creation multiple um, is lower and, and can absorb um, what, what might be some potential volatility in the marketplace. So those are our, our three strong takeaways from uh, from the last correction. And you know, we all experienced um, you know some 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 I think some really strong um, currents in that, that that will teach. I think will make us all um, as an industry much better investors. And also keep everyone disciplined around what the GPs are doing. You know, the keep everyone from overlevering their investments. Keep everyone from playing multiple arbitrage, too much multiple arbitrage, and and paying prices that are you know that they can't recover from, or underwriting to prices that they can't recover from. It really makes you focus on that base business that you need to you know really grow to. Because we're not in the business of playing markets. We're in the business of building and creating better businesses and backing people that can do that. So you know, that's, that's the, key, the key constant throughout the, the entire thing. And private equity has the generally a, a benefit of having additional working capital at its back. And you know, statistics will tell you that at the, the, the turn of the last recession, the companies that rebounded the fastest were the ones that were private equity backed. So it still makes it an attractive area for people to be because they have that wind, especially with the amount of dry powder that's out there currently. So one of the more positive things that will keep people driving to the, yeah, the asset class. That's, uh, that's a great segue, Dan. Uh, let's talk about dry powder and, and something that's near and dear to all of us here, which is the relevance of this for fundraising. Um, 
how, if at all, is, is a potential downturn affecting your marketing to LPs? How do you talk to them about downside risk? How do you talk to them about you know, what returns they should expect? How is this impacting that side of the business? You know, I think we're in a unique position where um, private equity as an alternative asset class has gotten a lot more favorable light recently and a lot more exposure. And it hasn't been so much of a conversation about explaining that as it has been, it's the attractiveness of the asset class has improved so much because the alternatives are not really there. You know, it's still, it's still outperforming it's still outperforming other asset classes overall. And in the long run, you're looking at that, you know, those recovery characteristics. So the, really the conversation is around, well, we're not in this for the short game, we're in this for the long game. That's the intent of all of our investments. And if we have to hold something, you know, to a little longer to get the return out of it we want, that's generally the intent of the investor anyway. So it's not a hard, explanation there, you know, from a, from a GP raising to an LP. On the other side, when we're talking from an LP's perspective, talking to a GP, a lot of the things you hear or see are, you know, are you over-raising, putting yourself into a position of peril by now trying to put yourself into a game of, I need to deploy capital at prices that are too high and I need to go above where I should be investing into businesses that are too large or I'm paying too much for them, um, am I now you know, starting to style drift my focus? Am I going into different directions? Is my return or my prior returns based on literally multiple expansion or are they based on EBITDA expansion? You know, is there, what are the key drivers to your return? What was your discipline like over that time frame? Um, because that's, you know, that's key to where, where different things we're seeing. So, um, but overall, I'm still seeing a very robust fundraising environment, and I, I haven't seen a, a dramatic slowdown of people coming into the market, and I haven't really seen a lot of pushback from investors. In fact, if, if anything, I've seen some acceleration. Some more fully invested bears. <laughs> Uh, Chris, Mark, what are you guys, what are you guys seeing? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's, um, you know, the fundraising environment doesn't seem to be um, uh, slowing down. I mean, we, we still, um, you know, see new competitors uh, in, in our business, um, you know, both here in the U.S. and, and globally. Um, so uh, new funds or uh, funds that are, you know, growing their AUM significantly that are now, um, you know, coming up into the middle market or the upper, upper middle market where we tend to play. Um, so I think there's no shortage of, of fundraising and therefore no shortage of competition as a, as a GP. I don't think we expect that to, um, you know, change. If you just look at the allocations, I think a lot of, a lot of investors are still increasing their allocations to the asset class. Um, so, <clears throat> you know, to us, I think it really goes back to um, you know, something that Dan said, which is making sure we're prudent about the amount that we raise and making sure we have the, um, you know, the team within our shop and then the network of, of management teams and operators and board members um, that are going to allow us to put that money to work and, and really drive, you know, good returns through uh, different economic cycles. So that's, that's our primary focus is, is, you know, really building the, te the team internally and externally to make sure that, um, you know, we can continue to deploy that capital and, and you know, not sacrifice the returns that, um, that we've been able to put up historically. Yeah, I, I, the only thing I would add is that, that um, in a market that is um, otherwise, other, most other asset classes are, are pretty fully priced. Um, and yes, private equity is fully priced, um, but given the breadth and, uh, and the scope of the opportunity, there are still, you know, opportunities to underwrite uh, to returns that haven't um, changed from the returns that we might have underwritten to five or six years ago. So, you know, the there if you're, you know, as as um, Chris and, and and Dan talked about, you know, if you're working hard to try and find or create those opportunities and working with those management teams uh, to buy down those multiples to lower your creation multiple, 
um, you know, private equity should still outperform, continue to outperform the other asset classes, um, and the entry points are attractive. Um, you know, while the market is frothy, uh, because of um, you know the breadth of the market uh, and because the opportunity to to add on and, and lower their creation multiple, you know, it it our our belief is that it still should be um, uh, a you know the, the one of the best or the or, or the best performing asset class over a sustainable period of time. Great. Well, let's stick with that same topic of kind of you know the LPs' views. If if we look at our industry as just one component of a broader set of asset allocation decisions that investors are making, what what do you think about? Private equity, you know, relatively speaking, is, a, is it a safer place for capital during a downturn than other, act, other asset classes? And if so, why? Chris, maybe we'll start with you. Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, I think there, um, there are elements that, of private equity that, you know, can make it safer uh, during, these, during these challenging periods. I mean, I think, um, you know, Dan alluded to it earlier, but... Um, <clears throat> we can be patient about our um, hold periods, right? So I think we, um, uh, you know, typically don't have um, uh, a lot of pressure to exit if, if something isn't going that well um, uh, and therefore can, can wait it out a bit. Um, so I think that is an advantage. Most of our companies are private, um, so they're not, you know, subject to um, the quarterly fluctuations uh, or the quarterly pressures of a, of a public company. Uh, and therefore can, can plan and invest for the long term. And then I think about it, you know, um, uh, again, uh, from sourcing to portfolio management or sourcing or deal doing to portfolio management. On the deal doing side, I think we, you know, we do have the ability with most of our um, deals and most of our companies to do um, really deep due diligence, you know, and get into these companies and, and um, understand the specifics of the market, the competitive dynamics, and then, you know, that, how that company is going to play um, and so I do think that is an advantage, um, you know, relative to some of the public uh, market situations that, that are out there. And then um, another point that I would make, too, and I think we've, we've talked a lot about the importance of, of management teams um, on this panel already, but, you know, the reality is in, in most of our investments, at least at Advent, um, you know, we do have control. Um, so we control the companies, we control the board, and, and therefore we can make, um, you know, changes when we think changes need to be made. So if we, you know, have a CEO who's maybe not up for um, uh, managing through a downturn or, or a management team that isn't, um, you know, built out enough to manage through that downturn, we can, we can make those changes um, and we can incentivize those uh, managers with uh, with longer term um, incentive packages versus just base and bonus and and let them play for the longer term uh, equity upside so I think those are some advantages that um, that we have relative to you know some of the other asset classes that you all might might look at yeah I, I agree I think the 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 opportunity of being that being private affords you um, is is really unique um, really only having to focus on building the best business possible over the longest period of time, um, you know, and, and having that mindset um, really allows you to make those long-term investments in, in, in the core management team, the long-term investments in, in the infrastructure um, acquisitions and, um, that would, um, might otherwise take a, a slightly longer integration and payback period. And so, you know, as a result of that, um, if you're prudent in this environment, uh, you know, we still are bullish on, 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 on the risk-adjusted returns of private equity despite the, the illiquidity relative to the other asset classes that, that, that are available. I, I totally agree with everything that's been said, and I'd say, you know, it's, it's even more relevant at the, we play in the very low end of the market, so very small deals and very small funds as well, and at that end of the market, it's even more prevalent to the types of the, the culture that kind of comes together and the relationships that gets formed between um, businesses, their vendors, their counterparts, even their competitors, employees within the cultures, the management teams, et cetera. So there's really a, you know, even a camaraderie and, and, and a tight culture that, that becomes even tighter in, in circumstances like this that works with, um, the boards, the, man the management, as well as the owners. So I, I find that's even uh, even a more 
beneficial. Maybe a, an add-on, shall we say. Great, okay. Uh, last question before the, for the panel before we open it up for Q&A. Um, you may have noticed I have studiously avoided asking the titular question of this panel this morning, which is, the bull market, is it about to end? Um, I know it's still early in the day, um, but can I talk anybody into uh, venturing some views as to what, it, what a downturn might look like, when it might happen, uh, what the precipitating events might be, what signs you're looking for, uh, or other thoughts? Sounds like a really good question for Dan and Chris to <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll, I'll venture a guess, but no one can hold me to this because my crystal ball is pretty fuzzy too. Um, I don't personally see anything for the next 18 months or so, so I'm going to go out and say somewhere between 18 and 36 months we might see a type of correction. I don't think it will be very severe if we do, or at least anywhere near the type of recession we saw in 2009. Um, you know, severe fluctuation in the credit markets would probably be, you know, be seen approximately six months ahead of time. So something to, you know, monitor heading into some type of major correction. You know, at the same time, the global macro environment is not in the same position that we were in. It's much stronger than it was in 2009, so there's some bolstering there. Um, but I, like I said before, I don't, I don't think there's, I don't see anything personally that's a big trigger right now to be all that worried about that we, the, the strength of the economy is, is generally um, strong enough to weather even a potential correction in the, in, in the stock market itself. Um, so that's a couple of my two cents, but. Thank you. Chris, Mark? Yeah, yeah I mean, I would say um, uh, I won't uh, put a mark out there in terms of uh, a specific prediction, but maybe I'll give you a sense of, um, you know, some of the things that we're watching. I mean, I think certainly, um, you know, interest rates in the U.S. Um, are something that we're paying attention to, as, as a lot of people are. Um, again, we, we look at things from a, a global perspective, given the nature of our funds and, and where we invest. Um, you know, we have seen the impact of, of rising rates on um, some of the emerging economies uh, already. And right? so I think Andrew alluded to it earlier. Um, you know, we do a fair amount of investing in Latin America. Um, and you've seen, uh, you know, some movement recently in Argent places like Argentina and Brazil. And so um, that's something that we are uh, watching. But we've been in those markets for a long term, uh, for a long time. And so, you know, in some in some ways, this could be a good opportunity for for us to to invest there. Um, you know, as it relates to the U.S., I, it is interesting. I mean, I think we're you know the credit markets continue to be really strong, but we are starting to see signs of um, you know how that more expense rising rates and the more expensive debt. Uh, is playing into our portfolio companies, so we're you know being very mindful of our hedging strategies and just trying to you know think about the uh, you know the capital structures uh, over the next uh, four to seven years. The other factor is um, you know the U.S. consumer. I think that was a you know a, a big source of of what happened last time. Um, you know, it seems like the consumer is uh, in better shape now. Um, uh, versus going into the global financial crisis, particularly um, as it relates to um, leverage levels. Um, but, you know, you are starting to see some signs in, in areas of the subprime markets where, you know, uh, leverage levels are creeping up for consumers. So those are some of the things that we're um, uh, watching uh, as, we, as we, you know, think about what the, what the next downturn might be. Mark, any other thoughts? No, I, I mean, I think... Um, I'll cut it aside. I, I, I agree with everything that, that Chris and Dan have said. I think the, the, you know, the, the next 12 to 18 months, um, at least in the U.S. economy, uh, appear to be strong. Um, and, and, and structurally, um, you know, some, of the, some of the excesses that we, we experienced in 08 and 09 or witnessed in 08 and 09, we're not seeing. We're not seeing the, you know, the consumer's balance sheets in, good, in strong shape, as, as Chris suggested. Um, you know, we, but there are some things to watch, watch out for. We're, we're, we're clearly looking at, at the U.S. consumer um, and um, the level of, of, of leverage there in, in new asset classes. Um, you know, you saw home equities be a, a big, important uh, part of, uh, of, 
of the balance sheets uh, on the 08, 09. Now you're seeing student loans. Um, and that's really a demographic change that you're seeing uh, run through, through, through this, the economy and the cycle. So that's something that, um, you know, it's now the second biggest um, uh, debt uh, component of, of, uh, of con the U.S. consumer. Um, and we haven't seen the resiliency of, of those loans um, in, in otherwise stressed periods. Um, second, interest rates, obviously. Um, and, you know, we've been in a... a, a, a a benign interest rate environment for the last 10 years, almost, almost, um, you know, certainly uncalled for, uh, unheard of before. And so, you know, we, we like Chris and, and Dan are focused on, on making sure that, that our balance sheets of the businesses that we're investing are resilient. And then lastly, um, is really international trade. Um, you know, Europe is, is, um, um, has, 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 um, sort of, um, not grown as, as, as strongly as, as, as economists had, had been project, uh, predicting. Um, we now see some, some, some softening there. We've seen some issues on, on trade. And so while we're not investing in companies uh, that, that typically are, have international exposure, it does change the overall environment set. And so we're focused on that uh, uh, fr from, a, from a macro perspective, but certainly not from a micro perspective from our portfolio companies. Super, great. I think we have just a couple minutes. If there are any questions from the audience, we'd be delighted to uh, take them on. Analysts, is, as you think about uh, where we are in the cycle, are you seeing any changes from investors in terms of investors maybe starting to signal that they're preparing for the next downturn? Do you want? No, go ahead. I, I don't know if what I'd define as signals, per se. Um, I feel like everyone's generally on the same page, that we're all saying the same thing as, hey, we're nine-ish years in here. It's something's going to happen, and I know it, but I want to keep investing. So... I want to do that in a sound manner, so let's make sure that's top of mind, you know, and that, and that I want to make sure everyone around the table is thinking of it, and I want to make sure you've thought of it and know that I've thought of it, but that's, but other than that, it's just, it's just, you know, such an upfront topic that have they done anything different? Not that I can, you know, particularly point out. So I would agree. One of the things that we've, we, we've obviously all seen as a re result of the low interest rate environment is it, it's created, um, you know, th there's been a, a, a dramatic shift. If you looked at most pension plans, insurance companies, um, banks, balance sheets over the last uh, 10 years, you've seen that fixed income has, has, has gone from the largest asset class to uh, you know, somewhere in, you know, depending on, on, on the institution, somewhere in the 15 to 20 percent. And so uh, that's created um, a fair amount of, one, pressure on returns um, and, and a fair amount of excess capital. Um, it, um, so you've seen that has translated itself into allocations uh, for private equity continuing to go up. Uh, so. While, and that's as a result because the, the result of, of, of the fixed income uh, rates and, and many, certainly on the, on, the, on the pension side, you know, there are still large gaps uh, between the um, um, uh, funding amounts and, 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 and the current expectations of, of, of um, returns coming off of those portfolios. And so, you know, there's, uh, you, while, um, People, our, our investors are, are certainly cautious about the environment. Uh, allocations are generally going up, and they will continue to go up for this asset class, given the, these two you know, fundamental changes in the marketplace that exist. Yeah, a question over here. Yeah. Yes, uh, Laura Kreutzer from the Wall Street Journal. I have a question uh, about the uh, sort of rise in um, firms that are trying to raise permanent capital funds and more longer life funds, say with lives of like 20 years, 
25 years or longer, and to what extent you guys feel like you might be at a, a disadvantage to these types of funds or uh, what, if at all, what kind of threat they might pose competitively for you, given um, that they may be underwriting to different kinds of returns and are able to hold these companies longer. I mean, I realize you hold your companies, you can hold them for a decently long time, but at some point you do have to exit them, right? And uh, the longer you hold them, the more it digs into that uh, IRR. So I'm just curious, any thoughts on sort of the advent of permanent capital or longer life funds and how you view them in the marketplace? Yeah, I'm happy to take that. I mean, I think we've, um, you know, we, we've certainly noticed some of our uh, competitors um, raising those vehicles um, and have been, you know, mindful of the, um, you know, the potential risks or, or challenges that, that they create, many of which you, you highlighted. I'd say um, we haven't yet seen the, the impact of those funds. I mean, I, and, that, and that's not to say, you know, we're, we're um, not seeing competition. You know, we're, we're seeing plenty of competition in the deals that we're doing, but I don't think we're seeing um, uh, much that's very unique from, from those funds in terms of the way they behave, the, um, you know, the, the way they um, uh, underwrite and the returns they expect. Um, that, could, that could change, right? It's still early days, I think, for a lot of those vehicles. Um, and, and then we've seen you know, them, them a bit on the buy side, right, with, with some of our portfolio companies. And again, um, you know, the, the lines of demarcation aren't as distinct as we might have thought. And so, um, again, we'll see how that, that pocket of, of uh, funds evolves. Uh, but right now, it hasn't been as, as big of a factor as we might have thought. Terrific. This panel was so good, we either got another 30 minutes or it's time for us to get <laughs> off the stage. So. Um, with that, I'd like to thank my panelists. It was great doing this with you. Really appreciate it. Um, thanks for your questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.